Good evening and welcome to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg here, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa and science advisor Matt Moniz. And uh, we are broadcasting uh, live here on the airwaves and also now on Spooky TV. Uh, we have left the Fate Radio Network. Um, long story short, uh, Fate Radio is uh, making a change in direction and uh, a little worried about whether or not we can continue to do that with the, the radio situation here because we're actually on a broadcast station. Uh, a lot of the other Fate shows are solely on the Fate Radio Network, so it's easy for them to make the switch, but with us there's a little bit of uh, content, legalities, copyrights, you know, things that go over the airwaves here belong to the network here, so you know, we have to be real careful about things. So basically we're switching everything over to SpookySouthCoast.com slash SpookyTV, and if you actually go there right now you can get involved with the video chat. Uh, we have just myself in the chat room right now because we're waiting for everybody from the Fate Radio uh, page to make the transition over. But that's what we're going to be each and every week now. If you want to interact with us online and see the spooky uh, studio on camera, go to SpookySouthCoast.com slash SpookyTV. And over the course of the week, we'll change the links on the front page of the site as well. But we're real excited about this new page design that Matt Costa put together for us because you have the chat window, you have the video window, so you can see everything while you're chatting. Uh, and underneath we're going to have the archive videos from the last couple of weeks. And there's also, if you go to that page, a number of different apps that you can put on your uh, various iPhones, Droid phones, uh, uh, what's the other one, Windows phone, nothing for Blackberry yet, but they're working on it, uh, for the Ustream video. So you can watch us wherever you are. You can watch us on your phone. And then there's also the new, brand new WBSM live app, so that you can listen to us on your iPhone or your Blackberry no matter where you are as well. So. It's really a multimedia extravaganza there. So uh, make sure that you join us each and every Saturday night because the chat room discussion that goes on during the show <laughs> sometimes uh, even surpasses the actual show itself in terms of uh, the interesting level. So, But we've got a huge show planned tonight. This is going to be monumentous because it's a, it's a multicast. In addition to being Spooky South Coast and broadcasting on Spooky TV, we're also broadcasting on our history project dot com as well uh, for Craig Anderson's Our History Project show and we're going to have Craig join us in a little bit later on. We're going to be talking about the ghosts of Plymouth with a number of guests uh, and I've, I spent a lot of time growing up there as a youth and, and I've had experiences in that town and so we're going to talk about a lot of that stuff and we're going to find out how you can go and experience a lot of these spirits for yourself as well. But right now we have in the studio joining us Steve Perry from the South Coast Toy and Comics Show, which is coming up on December 5th at the Seaport Inn and Marina uh, here in Fairhaven. And Steve, I, I gotta tell you, for guys like us, we geek out for this kind of stuff, so to have it right here in our own backyard is really exciting. This, this isn't the first one that you've done though, right? No, this will be the third one. This will be the third show. And uh, in, in the, the, what has the response been to the first two? I mean, is it, do you seem to see it growing? Is it a lot of local people, or are you finding people are coming from all over for these shows? This show is definitely growing. We've gone pretty much all. There we go. Sorry about that. No problem. The show is definitely growing. We started out at the VFW Hall, our first two shows, and we outgrew that. That's why we moved over to the Seaport Inn. And definitely now the show is getting much larger. We're starting to bring in celebrity guests, especially for this show, and doing the finding out where everyone's coming from, they're actually coming all the way from Rhode Island. A few people have actually come from Connecticut to the last show. Wow. And you, and you mentioned having celebrity guests, and there, there's uh, uh, quite a number. Uh, Felix, is it Sila? Is that Felix Sila, yes. Sila? Yeah. And who everybody might know as Cousin It. Yes, but he's, Cousin He's it. had a number of other roles in... in yes, he shows. also played Tweaky on Buck Rogers' TV show. He was an Ewok on Return of the Jedi. He was also on Planet of the Apes, and he played Lucifer on Battlestar Galactica. Excellent. So... Moniz, you've probably 
known a lot of his work, maybe not knowing his face, but you've probably known a lot of his work. Cause all of them. Yeah, yeah, those are all things that I know <laughs> that you're a fan of. And uh, you also have Gabby West, who is uh, in the new Saw 3D film. Yes, yeah, we do have Gabby West from the new Saw 3D. She's also the winner of VH1 Scream Queens 2. She'll be joining us. And they're all, she's also bringing along with her from Lionsgate. We're going to have some of the actual props from Saw. You're going to have the doll. I don't have to bring in the doll, but I'd love to see it. <laughs> I don't know what they're going to bring us. And uh, also uh, some wrestling personalities as well. You have uh, Ox Baker and, and Doink the Clown. Yes. And and Doink the Clown, I can tell you, the he, he's a character. Oh, he's hilarious. He definitely, people are dying to see him. <laughs> and uh, and uh, from a paranormal perspective, we have some friends of this program, uh, Keith and Sandra Johnson of New England Anomalies Research, and Penny Dreadful, host of Penny Dreadful Shilling Shocker. So, those are two people that have been here with us on the program pretty much since we started. Oh, definitely, we're great to have, happy to have them in. And, and what's interesting too is in addition to having all these celebrity guests, so you ha you do have some real comic people there. It's not just the vendors who are coming to sell their wares, and you actually have people who are involved in the comics industry. Yes, we actually do. Um, we have about a dozen comic and animation artists coming in. Um, also, we have Bob McLeod, who was pretty well known comic artist for Marvel Comics and Dark Horse Comics as well. Beautiful. He's worked on quite a bit of titles and he'll be there as well. And and for those who have never been to one of these shows, I mean you, you really get a chance to talk to these guys and, and pick their brains and find out not only about their own work but about the industry as a whole and and I know that it's made a lot of changes uh, in recent years. Uh, obviously everything in publishing is down uh, but when, when you have an event like this you can realize what a strong audience there still is for something like comic books. Definitely. It brings a lot of people from all avenues that are still into the comic books and cartoons and everything to that aspect. It gives them a lot of better chance to meet and greet with the people they you know, read their comic books and people they've seen on TV. Was there a particular comic book that, that sucked you in when you were a kid? Was there one that grabbed you? And Probably Batman. I yeah. with that. I remember the first comic I ever bought. I was uh, maybe five or six years old and I bought a, a Spider-Man at the corner store and I was like wow I can get all this stuff for like 15 cents <laughs> this is great and that's where I just started and from there I mean I was I remember I used to go to the flea markets and I would buy just whatever dollar comic I could find and this was in the uh, the early 90s when every comic had something to do with a ninja yeah exactly <laughs> so uh, <laughs> but through that you know I found things like Boris the Bear and a lot of these more I don't want to say subversive but more underground stuff that people might not have known about I mean I remember passing issues of the tick with my friends long before it was a Fox animated cartoon. Right, yeah, I definitely remember that too. So, it, I think this area has got, got a very huge fan base for this, and, and the fact that toy collecting is, is through the roof now, yeah. uh, to the fact that it's killing my collection because everybody has what I have now. I'm in the same boat as that. I've been collecting toys for probably about 20 years now, and you know, a lot of the stuff, it's, it's coming up a lot quicker since they're redoing every toy line into a movie now. Yeah, yeah. Bringing it all full circle again. And a lot of these vendors that you're going to have there, yes. are they going to be selling things like comics and toys? And yes. their own? And I know that you have some artisans too with their own their own crafts and things. Yes, the artists will be there. They'll be selling their art. They'll also be doing commission work for any of the art pieces that you like to see them do. Plus all the vendors will have a huge variety of comic books, toys, collectibles, gaming. We actually have a couple of video game guys coming in as well. Nice. So this will be December 5th uh, from 10 to 4 at the Seaport Inn and Marina in Fairhaven. That's at 110 Middle Street. And you can go to southcoasttoyandcomic.com for more information and to purchase tickets. And uh, you can't beat it, though. Admission is only $6. And I know that all over the place I'm seeing these little flyers that give you a dollar off admission. Yeah. So you can pick those up pretty much anywhere. And uh, that'll get you a uh, dollar off the admission, but it's even at six dollars, it's a great price to go in and meet some of these celebrities and, and talk to some of these artists. Definitely, and if you go online to buy the tickets right from the website, it'll give you the dollar discount as well. Beautiful. Now, if I can just make one request for a future future sure. show, Keith Giffen. Is there any chance that you could get Keith Giffen to come? I know he's kind of reclusive. Uh, I don't know if you're are you familiar with him. Yes. He's kind of uh, a little underground. But for those who don't know. He created my fam favorite comic book character of all time, Ambush Bug. And I'm <laughs> I might be the only person I know who's a huge <laughs> Ambush Bug fan, but, uh, it, but he also had the Thriller comic back in the 80s mm -hmm. and a number of other titles that uh, he's worked on since. So. Yeah, that, that'd See be what I can do. 
All right. Well, thank you very much, Excellent. Steve, for joining us. And thank you for having us on. We'll talk more about this in the coming weeks as we get closer to the show. Excellent. All right. Well, we're going to take a break now. When we come back, we're going to get into the ghost of Plymouth with our guests tonight. And pretty much if there's a ghost to be found in Plymouth, between the, the trio of guests we're going to have on, they probably found it. So stay tuned. We'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast and also broadcasting live on Spooky TV. Pharma Health Pharmacy, a local independent pharmacy, provides medication services so like... So how did you, uh, <laughs> how'd you <laughs> land the people you did? That should have been another question. They provide personalized yeah, solutions. Yeah, I don't want to land the inside. Then everybody else starts making their own. Yeah, yeah. 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 I'm talking about Pharma Health Services by stopping by one of their... Well, the next thing you know, we're going to try to throw us off. Yeah, surprisingly, a lot of them started contacting me. Actually, just on Thursday, John Schneider called me out of the blue. Oh, yeah? I'm like, what's going on? He's like, oh, yeah, I heard you're doing the show. Let's see if I can come down. Talk about it. Well, that's why I was thinking, like, the first thing that I thought of when I saw it is, why don't you have Brian Harnwa from Ghost Hunters? Replacing yeah. the upgrade is huge time for guys. And so is your affordable yeah, veteran floor covering just in time for yeah, your holiday yeah, no. events. You'll find great deals yeah. on anything yeah. yeah. goes carpet, yeah. cars, yeah. Yeah. and Appalachian wood yeah. floor. Armstrong well, and Lux Factory Dining, Armstrong and Bruce Laminates, American Olean, and Hospital Ceramic Tiles, anything in the area, and all the floor covering, new of their interlocking ceramic tile. New Bedford floor covering, 455 Union Street, New Bedford. All right. Well, I'll, I'll be in touch with you, too. Okay. We'll, we'll talk during the week. You're looking for, like, musical guests, too? Surgery Would you like to perform? Like like I'm right, thinking about that. Let's get Craig on the stage. I'm going to start trying to do some big shows. Okay, because I got to keep probably hook you up with a couple of guests. One great band that can get on. Get their money. If you can log in with Spooky South Custody, I'll help you. Do you know who they are? Phenomenal, as far as local. Yeah, we can probably hook you up with some bigger stuff. Like the EVPs? Yeah. 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 The EVPs. <laughs> yeah, well, we'll leave that alone. <laughs> and that's our band. Yeah. Ah, uh, okay. But we're not very good. We're just trying to get fresh up. Uh, for something around here, we could probably talk a little bit. Doing it with something cheap. Uh, I don't want to quote, quote a price for it. We didn't have him say something else, but. What's the last thing we heard on that was good? Um, like what's a good price for it? Like what they do before? Uh, put it this way, these guys are probably doing stuff for as low as about. Hi, sports fans. This is Bill Speaking. But yeah, remember these guys. It's part of Boston and his yeah. stuff like that, yeah. so it's not if they feel. Like it, right? Yeah. Just like the team at Paul and Dixon and Stoddard's Jerry. Every day. Sorry, we're still waiting for one more. They definitely are. Uh, Save hundreds of dollars. Yeah, right there, really good. Check, there she is. Moni's going to open the door. The coverages and benefits for you and your family and answer all of your questions. And today, there are lots of questions. In short, they'll give you the professional attention you deserve. They've been doing it for over 150 years. Don't leave your family's financial security to chance or worse to an 800 number or faceless website. Join the team and be a winner. Contact Paul and Dixon, downtown New Bedford, or Stoddard Insurance in New Bedford's North End. Check them out on the web at pd-ins.com. Paul and Dixon and Stoddard oh. Insurance. For more than a century, insurance with integrity. Of Cushman, Fairhaven, Dartmouth, and New Bedford. We have you covered. AM 1420, WBSF. Nice to meet you. Hi, I'm Tim. Hi, Tim. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. I'm Jane. Amanda. How are you doing? Scott. Scott. Tom. Tom. Nice to meet you. So we're in a commercial break now, but we're going to jump right into things when we come back. Um, so why don't we have Tom and Scott? I'm going to try to number them. Not mess up everybody's names. But everybody, come on over and grab a mic. Louise and I can share this one. The devil should get suspended from baseball. I said I need help. I can't um, there that should that be headphones for everybody. We need. You'll need the headphones to hear Craig, who's going to be our co-host, Craig Anderson. If we can get stuff to work. Here, take this one. 
I want to keep you out of your chair. Is it for real? Is it for real? Headphones set short. I just closed my eyes. I'm going to touch that. Yeah, I'm going to touch that. Yeah, I'm going to We've done something. Miracles still happen. I am second. Whatever. We need one more pair of phones. That I don't have. And this ain't gonna work without a. I need it reverse. But when dry skin becomes itchy dry skin, it doesn't always help. But new Cortisone 10 Hydrotensive Lotion has the power of Cortisone 10 to relieve the itch, plus seven healing moisturizers to soothe and help heal like ordinary lotions. Not working. So next time your dry skin gets there itchy, reach for the relief no ordinary moisturizer can give you. New Cortisone call. 10 Hydrotensive. It heals as it moisturizes. Find Cortisone 10 Hydrotensive in the lotion. Needs to be one channel. What's up? That's not the latest yeah, right now. Right. Yeah. WPSM presents The Garden Guys, Sunday morning at 7. What to plant and when to plant it. Flowers, be better than nothing. Plants, yeah. and your lawn. Help for all your outdoor <laughs> needs. Oh, the on. Garden no, Guys. No, it works. It's just from 7 to 9 uh, on AM 1420. Yeah. Mono. So he gets one side, I get the other. If everybody wants to just take a slide down this way here a little bit and bring your microphones with you, kind of, then you'll all fit into the rule of thumb when you're talking, roughly about two to three fingers away from the mic when you speak. While we're waiting to connect with Craig, I'll give everybody a rundown kind of of uh, some of the locations I planned out. And of course, this is just an idea. We can freeform off of this. We don't have to stick to this. Obviously, Burial Hill. Coles Hill, uh, Spooner House Museum, the Trask Museum, of course, because that Lodi had to go and write about the haunted prime. The courthouse, you know, like the other stories from downtown, like the, the Woolworths and San Diego's, and then Cordage Park, State Forest, and things like that. Um, and any other things that you think we should discuss, we can talk about it in the break between the first hour and the second hour. Um, and then we're going to have Scott give us kind of the perspective, too, of just investigating within the town and, and you know, whether or not, we're basically trying to create the idea of is Plymouth more haunted than other places or is it just that their ghosts are a little bit more unique and so therefore it's, it's they stand out more. They're certainly older. <coughs> so they're certainly older, that's for sure. <laughs> now you guys Paranormal. All these? I'm just making lantern cards. You are. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you guys are welcome to hang out with the whole show anymore. It'll click. We all sat with Craig? I'm not sure if he's there. I'm going to put up. I'm going to put up. I'm going to put up. I have a problem. Yeah, I know. But well, it's, it's just that, that in-between area. There's that long hair, too. It's just, it's just getting it from when you have to shave it, that first one, it starts to... Uh, All right, it's enough. I can't. Is he in the chat room? He, he log, he's in the chat room now.
You know, you're not texting him, are you? Don't don't send him messages. It costs money. Yeah. Does it really? Yep. It's like twenty cents to send a message. He says that he's all set. So. All right, welcome back to Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg, the silent assassin Matt Costa, and science advisor Matt Moniz all here broadcasting live on Spooky TV as well. Just go to SpookySouthCoast.com slash Spooky TV and you can see that we have quite a full studio here. Uh, we have, going down the line, we have uh, Scott, is it Stalter? Yep. Scott Stalter, one of the founders of Pilgrim Paranormal Research. Check out their site, PilgrimParanormal.com. Tom Finn of Colonial Lantern Tours of Plymouth. That's LanternTours.com. And Janice Williams of the Dead of Night Ghost Tours, deadofnightghosttours.com. And all those sites are linked up on the front page of SpookySouthCoast.com as well, because we're going to be talking about the ghosts of America's hometown. We're coming up here on Thanksgiving, and naturally, whenever Thanksgiving comes around, the rest of the country starts turning to Plymouth. And we've got a, a national and an international audience here, and they love finding out about the ghosts in our area. And one town that we've never really talked about is Plymouth. And I, I, I spent a lot of time there growing up. I always thought that it had a, a cool vibe to it, and uh, obviously it's working out for all of you people pretty well because uh, we've got two very successful tours running and a paranormal group that's busy all the time, so uh, there's definitely ghosts to be had. I'm just going to go down the line a little bit and have everybody kind of introduce themselves and how they started things up. Uh, we'll start with Janice. Uh, how did Dead of Night Ghost Tours come about? Um, it was actually from uh, uh, one of my best friend's mother who died many, many years ago, came to me in a vision. And every night for about 45 nights, she would um, leave little bits and pieces like Colt Hill, Brigantine Arnold, things that really didn't mean anything to me. And after 45 nights of losing sleep and her being in my room, uh, one of the last things she said was ghost tours in Plymouth. And the next day I told my daughter, I said, just look up this stuff. And, and she did, and it did have to do with things in Plymouth. And from that day forward, um, we knew that that's what we were going to do. Very nice. Now, Tom. Uh, Colonial Lantern Tours aren't just ghost tours, it's just one aspect of the, the different tours that you offer there, right? Right. We didn't start off doing ghost tours, uh, but we started off in 1983 doing historical tours just from Plymouth Rock. And as we uh, <coughs> did the tours, it got more and more popular, and people started asking us for ghost stories. So pretty much every night they want to know, you know what ghost stories that we knew. We didn't have too many at that time, back in 83. <laughs> but I'm sure as you were taking people out onto these tours, ghosts started popping up. <laughs> and then stories, uh, you know, people are coming back to you, hey, while well, I was on the tour. Well, we started doing some research. That <coughs> one of the first ghost tours we got was from Station One Restaurant. Mm -hmm. uh, today it's San Diego's, but it's the uh, beautiful fire station all done over. And on the back of their <coughs> menu of the original restaurant, there was the ghost story of the fireman ghost. Mm -hmm. And that story came from the old colony memorial. Newspaper. So one of the newspaper reporters wrote, a, wrote an article that wound up on the back of the menu. And that was our first ghost story. <laughs> and it's just grown from there. Grown from there. And, and Scott, uh, about four years ago you guys started Pilgrim Paranormal? Yeah, we, um, there was four of us in the beginning. And uh, we were all worked for a cable company, local. And uh, we were all kind of hanging outside one day. And, you know, everybody watching Ghost Hunters. And we all started talking about how we all, you know, hang out in cemeteries. And, hey, maybe, maybe we should get together. We all got, you know, camcorders and, you know, uh, digital cameras, and uh, you know, just started from there. We all got together. We, you know, we buried Hill a couple times, and um, actually, had a friend of ours that, that said her mother had, a, you know, problems in the house that we weren't checked out, and you know, we kind of stumbled around, but you know, worked through it. And everybody has taps as their, uh, you know, guidebook, I guess. Yeah, that, that's, <laughs> that seems to be the way that it goes, and uh, and as long as they're, uh, you know, use uh, utilizing that as a jumping off point, they kind of they'll find they'll develop their own style pretty quickly because. TV edits make things look a lot easier. Oh yeah, definitely, <laughs> definitely. And so uh, also joining us on the line, this is a huge event tonight because we are multicast, uh, mul multicasting, uh, not only here on Spooky South Coast and Spooky TV, but also with our history project. And we have Craig Anderson, the host of our history project, joining us 
via Skype, and uh, if everything works out, Craig, are you there? Oh, we are spectacular, and this is, sounds like it's going to work out pretty well. And, and that's the thing. If you can just get it to where people can find it, they can't help but bump into the history and the ghosts. Now, uh, I know that you you live in Georgia, and you've got your own colonial era history down there. But uh, here, you know, this is where it all started. What's the outsider perspective of Plymouth, uh, not only in terms of its ghosts and its paranormal, but also uh, just in terms of you know this time of year, Thanksgiving. Everybody talks about the Pilgrims and the Mayflower. Is that pretty much the extent of, of what you learned in school? Well, we, we found later on that the Pilgrims really weren't uh, the, the glowing perspective that they had. Uh, they kind of some, some issues going on there, and we're going to talk about some of that uh, as we dive into the show here. Uh, but uh, one of the things that I'm the most impressed about with the fact that people are coming and taking these tours and learning about the paranormal in Plymouth is that there is just that direct connection. Uh, it, it's, I think, because of the paranormal aspect, they feel closer to some of the first settlers of this country. Whereas without that connection, it's almost like, okay, there are people that lived hundreds of years ago, and we don't have a direct, really, a feel to them. But with the paranormal, it's something that they're still there. They're still touching them in some fashion. Mm -hmm. um, we're going to go through some of these different discussions, and I, I can't see the show clock there, Matt. Okay, so we've got, we've got some time to really get into some of these things now. And one of the uh, sites that I know is probably on both tours and, and Scott mentioned it as well, is Burial Hill. And for anybody that's never been there, it should be one of the first places that you visit when you do make a trip to Plymouth because there's nowhere that you can experience the history of, of who was there at the beginning more than that. And uh, it's, what, what was probably the most profound experience that you've had there, uh, Janice, in Burial Hill? Um, I think when we first started our tours like nine years ago, one of my first, we had a large group of people and um, we were coming up to one of the historical landmarks up there um, by the Howlands. And uh, some gentleman was camcordering and all of a sudden we were waiting for the rest of the tour to, to catch up to us and he was just filming, just doing a panoramic view when all of a sudden his, his camera, um, his, the first thing, his hair started to stand on ends. And then his camera got a little fuzzy, and as my rest of the tour group was coming up, it looked like somebody took a balloon to their hair and it was just all electrified. Wow. Everybody's cameras went dead, and everybody's cameras remained dead until we got back to the waterfront. And the gentleman had a spare battery in his camcorder, and when he put it in there, he had a, a figure that came from behind the tree, a tall cloaked figure, kind of just stared him down, and then the static went in on his um, little camcorder, started to and, and that was it. I mean, that was like one of our first major experiences. Now, Tom, I know that uh, with, with all the great sites that you must bring people through on, on a historical tour, people that I know that take historical tours everywhere, no, even non-paranormal people, it's always the cemeteries, always the burial grounds that seem to draw the most attention and, and seem to be the, the fan favorites of the tour. Is that the case with Burial Hill with a lot of people that you bring around? Uh, yeah, I would say Burial Hill is definitely the highlight of the uh, Ghost and Legend walking tour that we do, which uh, we do that every night, April through November. And uh, pretty much up there, it's one of the most active places for people who do get ghost pictures. I can't think of any other cemeteries where I've heard of people getting more pictures. Pretty much every time that I go up there to get pictures, we get something. And um, everybody that I know does as well. Now, uh, for those who aren't, aren't familiar with, with the idea of of Burial Hill. It's kind of set back a little bit from the main road and you got to kind of go up this creepy looking road uh, to get to it. And uh, if you've ever gone to the, uh, I would hope that most of our local audience has gone to the run of the mill at some point at the Jenny Griff Mill for the best burgers around. Uh, but if you do go there, it's kind of across the way there. And, and 
it's where a lot of the early settlers of Plymouth uh, lie, including Squano. And what I've, he's probably one of the most fascinating figures to me in colonial Plymouth history because here's somebody who, for those who don't know, was kidnapped by the English uh, well before they, they landed here and settled here and brought to England. So when he came back, he was kind of like a, a built-in buffer between the natives and the English. And you, I'm sure that uh, with, with the history of it, Tom, uh, you must discuss quite a bit about whether or not he was betrayed later on in his life and that led to his death. What's your theory and, and what ended up happening to Squanto? Because he kind of played both sides of the scene for a bit. He did. He was not a member of the Wampanoag tribe. So he was a Patuxet, and those were the Plymouth people. But while he was away um, in Europe, all of his family members died off from some sort of disease, probably either smallpox or maybe rubella, but something just that spread like smallpox very quickly. And it wiped out all the, <clears throat> the folks that lived in the Plymouth area, probably about somewhere between 2,500 and 5,000 people. All were dead. And the only surviving member of that tribe was Squanto. Um, so going to live with the Wampanoags later on when he came back, he was not a family member. It's kind of <laughs> like <laughs> the Italians down in Providence, you're either in the family or you're not. And, and, and the theory, I, I guess, is that when he came down with an illness is that he was poisoned. Uh, and it, we've seen this in, in a number of other Native American figures in history uh, w with, there's the suspicions with uh, Wamsutta, and then, of course, that all hell broke loose between the natives and the, and the colon, uh, colonists then. Uh, but, and I know he's in an unmarked grave within Burial Hill. Is there any idea of exactly where he might lie? No, Janice, you're shaking your head? No, no I, don't, I'm, I, don't, I don't know where he is. I'm, I'm just wondering if any investigators have ever gone out there. Scott, I don't know if you've heard of any investigators going out there trying to figure out where his body is. Uh, we haven't actually looked at him. Um, no. We have Massasoit's <laughs> Mass, um, uh, King Philip's head, which curses uh, the town square. Well, that's not there anymore, thankfully. But <laughs> uh, that, that's a very interesting story. Was it 20 years that it stood outside the, the entrance to Plymouth after they... Yeah, something like they 27 headed. years. Yeah, that's like. ridiculous to imagine. Sure, absolutely. I don't, I don't believe that he was taken at the same time, but uh, Samoset was another native person who spoke English and very similar to Squanto had been captured the same way, but I don't believe it was at the same time. So there's 29 other potential, you know, go-betweens there that we don't know anything about, but you know, Craig, it's always the controversial ones that survive in history. No, I, I think you got everybody stumped there, too. <laughs> no, that's all right. I mean, uh, see, we take for granted, Craig, the fact that we're right down the street from Plymouth Plantation, but, uh, there, you know, there's actually a whole, it's not just a, a quote-unquote historical theme park. There's a whole research group there. Um, I mean, that's, I would definitely suggest getting in touch with them for more information about things like that. Alright, well, we're coming up on the news, so we're going to have to take a break here, but when we come back, we're going to get more into the Ghosts of Plymouth. 
uh, including plenty of sites that you can actually go out, just hop in your car at any time of night and drive by and check out. I'll share a story about something that happened to me. I'm not convinced it was something paranormal, but something happened to me when I was younger at, uh, at a statue that I cannot get my wife to go up and look at. Uh, <laughs> now there's a few of them around Plymouth, but this one is uh, especially creeps her out. And we'll talk some more about some of these locations, especially downtown, these older locations. But there's also some more modern haunts, haunts as well. So we'll get into all that and more. Remember, if you want to view the Spooky Studio uh, on your ca uh, computer, you can go to SpookySouthCoast.com slash SpookyTV. That's where we're going to be broadcasting from now. And we're going to make the change on the website over the course of the week so that that can direct everybody there. But for whoever has, the, uh, has it bookmarked on their computer, that's uh, the new link, SpookySouthCoast.com slash SpookyTV, where you can get the archive videos, all the different apps to be able to watch it on the go and of course the chat to interact with us. And if anybody out there is listening and you're out and about in Plymouth, uh, we encourage you, if you go to any of these sites, hey, let us know, maybe there's some stuff going on. We always do our Bridgewater Triangle investigation show where we send teams out to these various locations that we talk about, and then we have them report back on anything that might be going on. So maybe some night we can have you know, all the different Plymouth sites and you guys can be out on the tours calling in with anything that might be going on as well. So, uh, And if you want to check out the websites uh, during the news break, deadofnightghosttours.com, lanterntours.com, and pilgrimparanormal.com. And you can find out more about the team and about the tours and, and figure out for yourself uh, when you can get out there and take some of these tours. How late do you guys go into the season with each of your tours? I'm open all year round until the snow flies. There you go. Uh, we have a regular schedule every <laughs> night up through Thanksgiving. And then if you do call in for reservations uh, anytime, we would take you out. Preferably on the, uh, the more mild days. Yeah, not in the middle of a blizzard. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there you have it. So again, uh, deadofnightghosttours.com and lanterntours.com uh, to take one of those tours. We're going to take a break, and we'll be back with more uh, <coughs> broadcasting here on Spooky TV and on our history project and all their different incantations. So we'll be right back with more here on Spooky South Coast. Is everything moving for everybody all right? Kind of going. Yeah. I'm you trying to. to you want to go back and touch on first. The local 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 sports. This is WBSM. We we usually you know we kind of usually do more one on one interviews. Or we do do the occasional roundtables, especially when something like this would never come up before. So the U.S. is scrambling right now with the news that North Korea has a new uranium enrichment program. An American nuclear scientist visiting North Korea was shown a huge, previously undisclosed facility last week. The top U.S. North Korea negotiators being sent to Asia to consult with China, Japan, and South Korea. Before heading home to the U.S., President Obama at the NATO summit in Lisbon was asked about public outrage over the TSA full body scans and enhanced pat downs of passengers at airports. Mr. Obama says he asks at each meeting with counterterrorism officials and TSA if there's a better, less invasive way, but they say current uh, security. The only well, ones people trying to right call now, in on Skype, is that what was going they on? They consider it to be uh, those people that have been against uh, the yeah, kind of threat that we saw on Christmas Day bombing. Yeah. 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 Explosives in his underwear. I only Stand use that for, uh, the Catholic League, predicting I only use it for, for the Vatican will soon clarify. Like it's not, Benedict definitely Hill, not a good way to get published in a new book. Sometimes condom use is okay, such as by male prostitutes preventing the spread of AIDS. Catholic Church has long banned birth control. To the extent that he is uh, opening the door and now considering intent that there may be appropriate times when if the motive is good uh, to protect oneself from diseases that we could look at this in a different manner, that in itself would be dramatically new. Catholic League President Bill Donahue. A definite lack of good news in the latest update on the 29 coal oh, mine. Aircraft in and down down an explosion you yesterday in Wellington, New promotion. Zealand. Definitely. Poisonous and gas levels uh, up and down. Two dangerous for rescue crews. Right, excellent. New shaft, a uh, better test for air quality, will be drilled. Pipe River Mine CEO okay. Peter Whittle. Right, we'll set it up. Right, uh, doing nice the thing we've got. Thank you. Thank you. That means that there's some combustion. I guess they're complaining that they're not getting the, the Skype the, the coming over. There's still no the word here. from the trap miners. The Skype should come over to the WBSM feed and come out of this, right? Because if we can hear it on the headphones, they can hear it on us. And what should be a matter of seconds, 
becomes a matter of Too minutes. Too much technology all Look, at once. your prostate can affect your bathroom that's habits. That's why, you know, you pull up there with flashlights and lanterns, and that's all you need. You better get your sleep if you're waiting at night to go. That's why you need to call for a free bottle of Beta Prostate. Yeah, he made it. And join the tens of thousands of men who've already taken charge of their health. Beta Prostate is made with natural plant sterols that support healthy urine flow and healthy sleeping habits. It's the formula no man should be without. That's why, for yeah, a limited right. time, new customers can get a bottle yeah, free. Right. All you have to do it is call radio. Now. To get your free bottle of Beta Prostate, call 1 800 275 2074. You only pay shipping yeah. and handling. Supplies are limited, so one free bottle per household. Call for a free bottle of Beta Prostate. Call 1 800 275 1-800-275-2074. Al-Qaeda in the Arabian Peninsula calls its recent attempts with bombs on cargo planes Operation Hemorrhage. It claims it only cost $4,200. Russia is showing interest but stopping short of accepting a NATO invitation to join a missile shield designed to protect against an Iranian attack. NATO members agreed on the shield at the just concluded conference in Portugal. One theory in the case of the shooting death of a Hollywood publicist this week is that someone pulled alongside Ronnie Chase's car in another vehicle and opened fire. Former FBI agent and ABC News consultant Brad Garrett. Yeah, right. The key in this case is if it is the, a drive up, window down, or door sliding and shooting, those are so rare. And oh, you have awesome. to be really good at what you're doing to pull that off. Jason was killed early Tuesday, shortly after she attended a movie premiere. Former Major League Baseball player found not guilty. A jury in Fort Lauderdale, Florida, acquitted Jim Lahrens of manslaughter, a drunken driving crash, and killed a mother of the in December of 07. The jury did convict Lahrens of drunk driving, and they have punishable by up to six months in jail. Lahrens, who settled the wrongful death lawsuit by the victim's family for $350,000, criticized the investigation as shoddy, saying we wouldn't be here if there'd been a proper investigation. Lahrens is best remembered for a home run for the New York Yankees the 1996 World Series. ABC's Richard Cantu. This is ABC News. If you want a job instead of a career, have you been satisfied to work? Have you developed knowledge and skills? Who knows how far you can go? If you're interested in electronics technology, drafting and design, or information technology, call the IPT Technical Institute. Classes meet just a few times a week. But financial aid is available yeah, yeah. to those who are on the first I show we did. Now for oh more God, information, 800-554-2632. 800-554-2632. Chuck Severson, ABC News. Uh -huh. Nah, I don't be nervous. Not like, I've never been on radio before. So we, we, radio uh, version, I was like, I don't even know what to expect. We just tell everybody, <laughs> we calm everybody down by telling them nobody's listening on the radio. They all listen on the podcast later The problem is, is that everybody's listening on the radio right now. <laughs> It's just how we try to calm people down. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> how many listeners do you have? Um, we get three. <laughs> yes, <laughs> four because we just told somebody. Yeah. I'm saying, fortunately, it's all three are here. <laughs> no, uh, we we do. They it is a what's it a five thousand watt station. Um, during the day, yeah. Yeah, and it drops down to a thousand watts at night, so it does have a limited range. Um, and we always say, oh, there's nobody really listening at night, Saturday night, weak signal, all that. And then we'll have, like last week, we'll have a psychic in studio doing free readings, and the phone lines will let up the entire show. So <laughs> that's how we know that we do have uh, people listening. But we, we average about 15 to 20 people in the chat room, and then we average about 2,500 downloads a day of the podcast. That's good. And that doesn't include iTunes, because they don't report no, the numbers. No, that's just one site, and we upload to what, several? Yeah. And well, that's all the smaller sites. iTunes does not report it, and that's where most of our downloads uh, yeah, come from. So. Yeah. Now, at night, does the watching increase because of decreases? Well, no, no, I, I know they decrease it, but the distance, the, it'll, the distance, it'll have a longer, it'll have a longer longer range night on a clear night. night. Yeah. Yeah. But the problem is, is this station broadcasts unidirectional, oh, really? so you're going to get it all the way up into Bridgewater and Brockton, but you won't get it over the yeah, that's well, I got a buddy listening right now. I'm oh, well, I mean, it should it should carry, <laughs> but I'm just saying, like the direction of the signal. Yeah, yeah. They 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 call themselves, you know, New Bedford, Cape Cod. They say they go as far as Cape Cod, but and we do get people that listen to us down there. So.
You guys usually take call for take calls too. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll give out the phone numbers too, but I wasn't gonna try to get too much of the phone stuff because the way that the Skype is set up, Craig won't be able to hear the calls. I got you. So I'll kind of be repeating the, the stuff to him. I'm guessing that uh, somebody somebody from PPR is you and uh, decided that we're better than playing World of Warcraft. So that's a, that's a compliment. I don't know if you're playing right now. You might be watching. That's a compliment. That was one of my guys? Yeah. What was the name? Uh, it was the C Kid PPR. Yeah. I'm trying to talk to the guy in the. I don't play any of that stuff, but my wife is dying for that PC universe one. Oh, really? Yeah. She, like, never plays games, so it scares me because when she does, she's really good at it. <laughs> <laughs> like, she beat Little Big Planet in, like, two weeks. Yeah, just say he's going to play WoW with this is done. <laughs> Is everybody taking ham sandwich home when you leave? Three ham sandwiches with every radio in here. Hey, I donated a t-shirt, a book, a bumper sticker, like a bunch of stuff to the to the raffle at the holiday fair. And there was people actually fighting over the books and I was like, don't worry, I'm one. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah, but this one only costs us a dollar in raffle tickets. Oh, ah. Uh, uh. <laughs> I actually ended up winning a uh, few passes for one of those. Welcome back, hour number two here on Spooky South Coast. Tim Weisberg, along with the silent assassin Matt Costa, science advisor Matt Moniz, and we are broadcasting live on Spooky TV, SpookySouthCoast.com slash Spooky TV. And uh, we are also simulcasting on our history project, and we have Craig Anderson of our history project joining us as our co host tonight. Craig, why don't you give everybody all the different places where they can hear your show each week? Absolutely. And, uh, of course, that interview that we did uh, a few weeks ago for Spook uh, Ghosts of the South Coast is up there as well for people to check out. <laughs> yeah, well, it's, uh, it's, it's worth keeping up for a few more weeks and then just get rid of it because it's just taking up web space. All right. Same here. So uh, you can hear uh, the, the episodes that we've had Craig on as our guest as well. Uh, in the Spooky South Coast Archives. And tonight we are talking about the Ghosts of Plymouth. And uh, we have joining us, we have Janice Williams of the Dead of Night Ghost Tours. We have Tom Finn of Colonial Lantern Tours of Plymouth. And Scott Stal Stalter of uh, Pilgrim Paranormal Research. And we're talking about some of the different locations. Uh, a lot of them were the historical bent of them, of course, uh, being in America's hometown. And we were talking about Burial Hill. And Scott, I know you said that you guys have been out there and done some investigating. What are some of the things that have happened uh, while you've been out there? Burial Hill is yet to let me down. Uh, there's not a night that goes that we don't have some type of, of something happen. But um, one thing that, that we find is, is a little more unique with Burial Hill as opposed to most cemeteries. Most cemeteries, people don't die there. They're brought there after the dead. Whereas with Burial Hill has a pretty gruesome past from, you know, from everything from, from uh, mass graves of sailors from out in the, the harbor and, uh, you know, hanging trees. You know, they used to do their business at the courthouse down the hill. They take them up to Burial Hill, hang them, and bury them. So it's it's got a little bit of a more unique past to it than, than most cemeteries. Yeah, that definitely sounds like a place we got to get out and check out. We have a lot of luck in cemeteries, uh, so we'll have to get out there and check it out. There's, there is another 
uh, another burial hill uh, in Plymouth as well. And although I know there's some there is some controversy about whether or not it's actually true, but uh, at Coles Hill, uh, supposedly where the uh, pilgrims buried uh, the first of them to, to die off in that first winter, uh, wh what's the theory? Does anybody know what the theory is as to why they use that hill? Because I've heard there's actually a reason why they use Coles Hill. Well, I think it was um, they used Coles Hill because it was more secluded. Um, the last thing you want the Native Americans to know is how many people are dying because then you'd be overtaken by the Native Americans. So everything was done in secrecy on the lower hill, and they buried their dead in the dark. And it wasn't until after King Philip's War when they had a better relationship with the Native Americans that the fort was taken down, and that, then it was utilized, Burial Hill, as um, the place of burial. And for those who are not familiar or, or only have a passing familiarity with Plymouth, that would be the hill where the Wax Museum is and, and right. Pilgrim Hall, and, and that's where you have the Plymouth Rock right in front of it, yes. which I'm sorry to disappoint people that are listening outside <laughs> of the area, it's not the actual rock they landed on. Shh, don't kill our secrets. <laughs> I know, but I always thought it was really <clears throat> convenient that they decided to step foot right on the rock that already said 1620 on it. Yeah. <laughs> so they just knew right where to go. Um, well, 400 years ago, that all looked quite a bit different. And um, where the rock is, that was the, the point of the hill. Not it, today, it's a little cove. Mm -hmm. So it looks like you'd come into a cove there and land there, but it actually was the opposite um, pattern of, of land. So the hill 400 years ago was a little taller and uh, steeper, and it dropped off at the edge. Today there's like a four-foot stone wall that takes you down to the street level. Mm -hmm. But you had to imagine that coming all the way down to the water, which would have been uh, at least 12 to 15 feet. And having the rock there, <coughs> it was three times the size of what it is today. Two-thirds of it is missing from souvenir hunters that have chipped away at it, oh, wow. which it really got famous in the revolution. And that's when people were chipping away during the revolution, looking for a separation from England, sort of that holy spot where they first hopped off the boat. Right. But the burials up there, um, I would say that it was, you know, like Jan said, for the secrecy, they were being watched. They could look off their ship and see the natives keeping an eye on them. And they didn't want to reveal their weakness for sure. And they would bring them in at night and bury them up there secretly uh, so that no one would find them. But the first two that they did find in a washout was a man and a woman buried side by side. And they could tell that from the hip bones. A dog had found a femur bone down on the beach uh, one day, and they just went looking up there, and they found across the top of the hill at least 27 sets of bones wow. over the years. And some of them are undisturbed, for sure, in certain sections. And others of them, I mean, it, it definitely slows down your construction project if you find a, <laughs> a pilgrim burial. So some people, you know, haven't admitted to, uh, to finding things. What, what's interesting too is now they have the Massasoit statue, and uh, you know we're talking about them kind of burying them under the secrecy and trying to avoid the natives seeing them. And it's kind of like he's out there looking out, and it's underneath him. It's like the joke's on you, Massasoit. <laughs> you know what are you looking for? Uh, but it, I found some interesting uh, information out about uh, Coles Hill, including the fact that the town has never actually, for as long as that land has been there, they've never sold it off. It's been, it's remained you know, that town property. Uh, that, that's really interesting, especially considering it's a prime waterfront view. You know, you would think that at some point somebody wanted to build a, a big luxury apartment building or something right on the end there, but it's maintained that historical level right there. I think the, the state owns Cold Hill now. That's all state property down there. Oh, okay. so Memorial Park. Part of it was given park. from the town of Plymouth to the state to, for better, I think, better keeping of it. So some of the best waterfront property around? It's owned by the state. You can't get your hands on. <laughs> yeah. And who knows, maybe someday they'll have to auction it off. Uh, and then th there's another uh, memorial there. There's a sarcophagus, uh, which is really interesting because for those who don't know, that's basically a like a coffin that yep. doesn't get buried. And uh, that's where they've actually put some of the remains of some of these pilgrims that have been found. Pretty close to their place of burial. Is, is there any reports of activity? Uh, maybe, Scott, you've heard too. Is there any reports of any activity surrounding that sarcophagus, knowing that it's you know the remains of these pilgrims? We get a lot of photographs <coughs> of, of little girls up there. They're not pilgrims. They're, one looks like dating from the 50s. Another one maybe um, dating up maybe back from the 1800s, just by the appearance of their clothing. Haven't gotten any pilgrims up in that area or Native Americans. Yeah, we're the same thing with the little girl that you've seen. 
I know of one, kind of up the street a little further, but you know, we haven't done a lot of work down by that sarcophagus. Well, talking about little girl spirits, uh, you know, we can talk about the Spooner House Museum on North Street. And uh, this was built in 1747 and run by five generations of the Spooner family. And supposedly there's a little girl spirit that uh, inhabits this uh, particular museum. Yeah, the, the Spooner family is uh, the wealthiest family in the history of Plymouth. And they started in the China trade and then later on got into the rope making business. And they, um, the youngest son, Nathaniel Born Spooner, started up that Plymouth Cordage Company, which I know uh, Bob is a security guard over there, right? Yeah. Oh, cool, because we're going to be talking about Cordage Park a little bit later on. Little bit. But um, they did, they had the rope making company, they did really well. and. Um, the story that I've heard about the little girl ghost is that she was an orphan who lived in the house during the revolution and that they took in tons and tons of orphans because they were so wealthy and they were able to have these people there and um, there was a psychic who came on our tour um, her last name was Weiss I think her first name was Carol but uh, she came on our tour and she came up with this information that, that this was a little girl who was a, an orphan there that had died and it, and it seems to be uh, a lot of people seem to have an experience with this little girl. And uh, one one of the theories that I read on online is that uh, uh, she actually died of an abscessed tooth, which you know now we think is not a big deal, but back then, you know, it's just not so easy to deal with the dental problems. If uh, I don't remember when I went to my first dentist in Plymouth, but uh, it, and she does cause a lot of problems. There's a lot of reports of activity surrounding her in this museum. Uh, Scott, have you had a chance to investigate there? Uh, we the problem there is it's we've had a lot of trouble trying to get in because mm -hmm. it is a museum, and uh, so a lot of the investigating we do is is there's an alleyway that runs by the side of it or you know around the front of it, and there's been quite a few quite a few reports of of the same girl in different businesses up and down the street there. Um, I, I want to say it was on one of the Colonial Lantern tours. Um, they had a group going up, this is a secondhand story, but they had a group going up with little kids saying they were seeing a little girl in the, in the window and, you know, nobody else saw it, but, you know, they walked up from maybe one of you guys could, I don't know, if you knew the story from that. It's, it's, it's always, uh, it's a lot People are always seeing things in, yeah. in and, that house. Yeah. And it's children. usually the kid groups, the scout groups, that's the most ghost sightings yeah. that we tend to have <laughs> on the tour. So. Uh, and some of those you kind of got to dismiss, yeah. but... Uh, it seems like uh, child spirits are always the most active, too. They're always the ones that want to come out and play uh, more often than not. Uh, and, and it's interesting because there's a, another uh, location there on, on North Street is another museum, the Trask Museum and the Captain Taylor House. And this is, if anybody's ever read Edward Lodi's books here on the area, uh, there's one called The Haunted Pram. Well, this is where the Haunted Pram resides. And Craig, do you know what a pram is? And uh, in all of your, uh, in all of the different relic hunting episodes that you've done, has, has anybody ever reported coming up with a haunted one, or do we have the only one up here? Well, this is, this is, sorry, good. Sure. You sound, you sound like you're speaking from experience. Well, not from not from my experience. We had we had a little girl follow one of our one of our actual founders of our group home. Um, we're assuming it was a little girl. Um, I guess he had had he had a a long ride somewhere, and he, he kept feeling something whacking around at his legs. And uh, usually he'll burn he'll burn sage in his in his truck. If you know when we leave an investigation, we always go through and do some type of. Uh, you know, a cleansing to mm -hmm. try and keep stuff away. And this time he, he decided not to or put that to. And uh, yeah, he, I believe he, he, had, he had a long road trip, ended up coming back, and he ended up, it, it bothered him so much, he ended up back <coughs> at the cemetery, talked to it, talked to her the whole way back to the, to the cemetery. And uh, you know, brought her back up with him, let her go, and then he cleansed himself on the way back out. And yeah, it was, a, it really bothered him. Well, uh, with co Colonial Lantern Tours and, and, and Dead of Night Tours, if the ghost comes home with you, do you have to charge that person extra? <laughs> <laughs> From my experience, they've always stayed there. They're pretty settled right in that area. I haven't had any, but I've, get, I've gotten emails of people asking me, 
who the little girl looks out of the windows, why does she look so sad, who, who lives in the house. But I've never had anybody call and say, hey, I've got a spirit in my back, you know, my back seat. They pretty much stay with it. That's a great idea for an additional revenue stream. There you go. Admit, you know, there's no way to really prove it one way or the other. So, I'm oh, sorry, Craig, you were saying before? Okay. Uh, and this uh, this idea of the spirit looking out the window with a little girl at the Spooner House Museum, there's also a woman apparently that's seen at the, the Trask Museum gazing out the window. Is that kind of the idea of this, you know, waiting for the, you know, we always hear these stories about somebody waiting for a love to return from being out at sea. Is that kind of what, what's associated with this woman that's seen there? Yeah, well, that's what I'm picking up on. She's just looking out of the harbor waiting for the love of her life to return. Yeah, we had one of our tour guides that used to live in that building, and uh, she no longer does the tours anymore. She actually, because of what she saw there from the outside, having lived there and, and known that it was haunted, um, she saw a woman with a candle walking from one end of the building to the other, except that it's broken up by several apartments and there's no <laughs> access. So it really frightened her knowing the layout and what she was watching with the group um, while they were out there. And that, that one they do call the lady in white, and she has seen with a candle going from window to window back before. And I wish that I, I wish I had the words to describe to people not familiar with the area what this area of Plymouth looks like. I mean, you're basically stepping back in time, uh, you know, to 16, you know, 20s uh, on up to the uh, early 1700s. It's it's a it's an amazing area, and if you've never been here, definitely make the trip, and uh, you can take these tours and experience some of this, and and you can just get lost in the history on your own too. Um, yeah, it does have the oldest uh, three streets in America. The, the first street didn't have a name originally. It was just the street when they had only one street. <laughs> That's all and you need. Later on, it became uh, called First Street. It was um, first, second, and third. And then it became uh, First Street, Middle, uh, Middle and North. No, New Street. New, New Street. street. Yeah. And then it was uh, King, King and Queen. Um, Prior to the revolution, also yeah. there was some name changes. I think New Street went more where Main Street is. What? That was North Street. North Street. Okay. That was North Street was originally New Street and then North Street. North Street, right? And so there was a, a gate over there too at the um, the time around the King Philip War. Yeah. But those are the three streets that are there today. It's Leiden, Middle, and North are the three oldest streets in America that you know, permanently settled. And Certainly, if there's a ghost activity, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, and, and and of course the roads cross, and we all know what happens at, at crossroads. Those of us in the paranormal, um, also downtown is something that I, I I wrote a book recently, Ghosts of the South Coast, and I've been out promoting it for the past couple of months, and I did some signings at Edaville, and during their cranberry festival, and probably about four or five different people came up to me and asked me if I'd ever been to the the courthouse, the 1749 courthouse in Plymouth, and they all share with me experiences and they they're similar to the reports that I'm sure happen on the tours of, uh, of hair pulling and and uh, the, the sounds of dragging bodies was the one that really kind of got me That's when they awesome. tell me about that because <laughs> no when I did a little bit of research on it I found out they used it as a morgue at one point and so that the fact that they're still dragging the ghostly bodies around <laughs> <laughs> Tom's getting a, a shiver here, but um, and th that must be a highlight for people, not only because of the activity that comes out of it, but just because of the history associated with the building. Yeah. Um, that's where the sailors of the Brigantine Honor were laid to rest when they took them off the ship um, that ran aground off um, the, the, in the Plymouth Harbor. That was the, the perfect storm back in uh, 1778. Uh, they, a ship had set sail from Boston and it was supposed to be going to aid the Patriots in the war against the British. But because of the storm, and it was so fierce and bad, the captain, he decided he'd come into Plymouth Harbor to wait. But he didn't know the storm was gonna last three days, and it was, I, I guess, with fury. And um, it, the men just died, they froze to death. There was no way they could get in, no way that people could get out to them. Wow. And by the end of the third day, people went out in sleds to retrieve them off that ship, but by then it was too late most of those men had froze to death. So now they're pulling these bodies in, they don't know what to do with them, and the courthouse became the makeshift of the morgue. And they just lined all these bodies, they dragged them. Some of the men were so frozen together that they had to thaw these barricades of men in the town brook um, before they could get taken into the courthouse. 
So I, I didn't get that on the school tour. <laughs> <laughs> well, they did. They brought in. Um, there's two ships. There's the General Arnold and also the Revenge, and they had sailed together out of Boston. And the typical weather pattern, just like today, have a storm would come through from west to east, and then that's it. But the nor'easters gathered up their strength at sea and dropped back in on us, and they didn't have any satellite warnings or anything like that. So this one caught them totally by surprise. One of the worst northeasters that you can imagine. Dumped tons and tons of snow in the town. No one could even see them up there, or they could hear the men screaming, but nobody could even really see them because of a total whiteout blizzard. And it's just about a mile out. But there was, after a while, um, they were able to build a bridge of ice and make a, a sort of makeshift road out there to get horses and carts. And they brought in 88 bodies. And the men had got into the supplies they were carrying on the ship on the Arnold, which is the only one of the two ships that sank. The other ship sailed out the storm just fine and got away without having any trouble. But there's this one ship iced up, and uh, the mass broke and blew into the inner harbor, broke into two pieces, and the men started drinking the rum <laughs> that was on board and got uh, really drunk, which is not a good idea. If you're going to be out in the cold and you don't ever want to drink alcohol because you'll freeze to death a lot quicker. And that they huddled together, and it might have been some special form of rigor mortis, but they were never able to pry the bodies apart. And there's no photography from it, but there are some sketches. So, and you can see the expressions from the sketches that I've seen. It looked like some of them frozen and still screaming. So it's really, really gruesome uh, menagerie of bodies, you know, 80, 88 bodies. Some of them got claimed by family members, but there are 66 of them up in the mass grave. They had made a coffin, I heard. I don't know. It's uh, true enough that they need a coffin for each man. But they couldn't they, fit them in. They couldn't use them because they were unable to pry them apart. Some of the guys even had to be chopped out of the rigging of the ship. Wow. Frozen up in the rigging. Trying to stay and then you have the two men that were um, John Russell and somebody else. They were buried together um, on the backside of Burial Hill. And, uh, why they were buried together, I don't know whether they were frozen to death, but they, were, they weren't in the mass grave. Yeah, do you think of anything for a investigation standpoint of somewhere where there might be activity. You know, you've got this mass grave of, grave of men that, you know, really died a horrific death. You know, if there's going to be some type of residual energy, you know, if that's, and again, that's on Burial Hill. Like I said, Burial Hill is yet to let me down when I go up there. <laughs> well, it, and, and a story like that is, uh, you know, that really hits home what it was that they endured uh, at that time. And, uh, you know, we, we take for granted a lot of the technology that we have now and the fact that we're able to avoid these kind of things. Uh, but just, I couldn't imagine what it would be like to, to be out there, basically knowing that you're not just dying, but slowly dying. Uh, and and I, you've given me an image that will stay with me, I think, there, Tom, <laughs> with that description. What do you think of that, Craig? down the line. Janice, what do you think? I would say you have to stop at the courthouse and then walk into Burial Hill. Those are my two favorite places. The courthouse has a lot of the history in there, um, a lot of cool artifacts that they found in town. Um, you can go upstairs to the second floor, which is a recreation of how the courthouse looked way back when. You can actually see part of the gallows dating back to the 1800s. So that's kind of cool. And Craig, I guarantee you that if you do go to visit Plymouth, you will go to the courthouse because isn't that where the public bathroom is? Oh yeah. Yeah, so you're gonna have <laughs> yeah, to definitely visit that spend someplace. some quality time downstairs. You don't have to make a deposit; just go hang out. <laughs> Tom, what would you say? Um, I would say, over by the town brook is a is a really um, interesting place, very spiritual, where they had the um, both the natives and the pilgrims who had spent time there. The natives really weren't allowed into the village, so they had to stay up on. Uh, Watson's Hill, and they would have been sort of meeting right down by the brook in a little hollow area, and that's supposedly where they had the first Thanksgiving, too. So right over there, um, there was a, a big weeping willow tree, and they cut it down a couple of years ago, but supposedly right under that tree is where the first Thanksgiving was. And then also, um, Burial Hill is another real spot where you just don't want to miss it. It'd be a good place for condos, like you say, you know, up on the hill. Yeah. <laughs> and um, William Bradford, <coughs> would have been the one who picked it as their burial 
spot. It's certainly a good decision but based on their religious beliefs, which are a lot different than ours today. I wonder if uh, any of the Burial Hill spirits ever bother the guests of the John Carver Inn. You know, because you're, you're within pretty good walking distance for a ghost right there. They say on the third floor, is uh, they have some unusual things. All the doors will close. They'll leave them open for the winter months, and people go up there, and all the doors are closed, and nobody fesses up as to who closed them. The only spirits I've encountered there are down in the hearth and kettle. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Those are the good kind. Yeah, <laughs> Scott, what would you say? Yeah, well, it's funny you mention that. My, uh, my supervisor actually has, he used to work, uh, I don't know if he was cleaning rooms or if he was part of the maintenance crew, and uh, he said there was, a, again, on the third floor, he said there was always, he, he just, he had you know, ample amount of stories, but by far, Burial Hill, it is, again, not a night that I've gone up there, you know, to, and I haven't yet to be let down, but, you know, we'll go out for, uh, we'll go out for our team meeting, you know, we'll go down, down to the uh, San Diego's and, you know, have a drink while we're having a meeting, and uh, we always end up on Burial Hill always end up there. And for me, Craig, I would tell you that uh, you can go to the Ginny Grist Mill because it is the oldest uh, operating mill in the country and you can feed the ducks and then of course have a burger at one of the mill. And also get me one to go. There, there is a small fine if you do get caught feeding the ducks. Oh really? <laughs> You're not supposed to. It's a $20 yeah. fine. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Forget I said that. Just do it anyway, Craig. It's funny you mentioned uh, run of the mill too. That's, uh, we did an investigation there two years ago now. And uh, we had one of our founders was kind of the skeptic, the skeptic of the group, and uh, that's where he had his very first full body operation experience. Wow, oh, excellent! That, that was it was very impressive. Oh, did they did they feed you while you were investigating? No, it was a little late night. They'd already issued everything down. It was nice. Right. So we worked for food. <laughs> so was that with the owner Tom that died there? Was it food uh, from what he explained, it was a darker skinned person, um, and it was just, this was actually in the back room by where they hold the functions. With the uh, the closed door between the old the old mill and the, and the new restaurant, and uh, he said it was a darker skinned guy that he could see, and uh, so I mean, we were leaning towards you know an Indian, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, I was just was curious. A lot of people have talked about seeing the um, the most recent owner. He he passed away in there. And people have talked about seeing him. Yeah, that's. that's Right now I know to keep an eye out on a pet bird. Yeah, is like they actually get quite a few stories. Um, they actually have. We went to a media investigation. They had some patrons come in, people that are you know always there, and uh, plenty of stories. Well, plenty of stories. Well, and and that's a place that everybody can go and check out. Uh, another place that people can go and I know there's not a lot of. I mean, I looked on the internet, and we're kind of sticking in the downtown area here. Um, I looked on the internet, I didn't find a lot of stories associated with this location, uh, but I had an experience there when I was younger, and that is the National Monument to the Forefathers, or the Forefathers Monument, as a lot of people call it shorthand, uh, and that's on Allerton, and for those who have never seen it, imagine, you know, the most beautiful statue that just appears out of nowhere, because you're driving through a residential neighborhood, and there it is at the top of this hill, in this little park overlooking the water, and it's one main statue. Uh, which is faith, and then it's surrounded by four smaller statues and then uh, little reliefs uh, all the way around it. And it's, I mean, you can spend, you know, an hour there just reading all the different information there and, and, and finding out more about what this monument was built for. And it's 81 feet tall, so it, you, you would think it wouldn't pop out of nowhere, but it, it kind of does. And when I was younger, my dad used to deliver newspapers uh, throughout the whole town. And... Uh, we would stop there and he'd let me go up to the top of the hill and watch the sunrise. And so I was up there one day and I see, as I'm standing on one side of the statue, I see somebody running around on the other side. So I kind of go around. And it's split. For those who have never seen it, it's split. The main face statue is in the middle and then she sits kind of like on a cross of the other statues. And so as I'm going around the side, this person darts away again. And I kept going and going and going, and I was convinced that it must have been my dad messing with me. Because every time I looked, there was nobody there. And there, was n there was nowhere else for them to go. It's a big, wide open field. I would have seen them uh, coming or going. So when I went back down to the car, he was sitting in the car sleeping. So <laughs> <laughs> it wasn't him. Uh, so I don't know what it was, but that was uh, my experience. And that's, you know, my wife won't go up there. I, mean, I brought my son there just last week, and uh, she wouldn't go up and take a look at it. So has there been any reports that any of you have heard of anything going on up there? I'm not up there in a professional manner, you know, going up there, hanging out, 
for lunch, you know, that's about it. There's been a lot of problems there at night, like uh, fighting of local teens and, and a lot of different altercations and muggings up there in the past, <laughs> but not, nothing recent. They've been really keeping a close eye on it since the state did take it over from the Pilgrim Society. But it's the largest uh, solid granite monument in the world. It's, I think, 87 and a half feet tall. Solid and granite. Solid granite. Yeah, for the show. <laughs> it came from, uh, I think it came down from Quincy, the granite for that. But it came down by rail for sure, and they, <clears throat> they built it right there on the site. It took years and years and years to build, and I think Abraham Lincoln was the one that kind of helped it get finished off with his own personal donation of, I think, around $5,000, which wow, must have been a lot well back known, then. Yeah. Yeah. And, and solid granite, of course, means that it's full of quartz, <laughs> which means that it's uh, a good recorder of uh, electrical energy, which means that it's, if it's going to be a hot there, uh, it's going to help uh, factor into its uh, continued uh, experiencing there. So de definitely check that spot. If anybody has ever had an experience there, email me, Tim at SpookySouthCoast.com. I just want to know if anybody else saw the same thing that I did. Uh, another spot kind of on the other end of downtown before we go a little bit north, because I definitely want to talk about Cordage Park, uh, is, uh, is uh, let me make sure I say, it's the Jabez Howland House, am I yeah. saying that right? JB's. My favorite. JB's yeah, Howland it. House. <coughs> and this is a, a fascinating spot because it's, we know for sure that this is a, a pilgrim dwelling. And uh, has there been a lot of reports, because I didn't see a lot of reports associated with it, but I'm assuming that you must hear stories about things going on there paranormal-wise. Last summer, when they were doing some renovations on the outside, there was shingle on the outside of it. And what we find is spirits hate change. And right now, if you notice, the Spooner House is getting under renovation. So I'm eager to hear what those workers have to say. But anyway, getting back to the Howland House, um, we had one of the one of the men that were was doing the shingle on the outside, and he wanted to fin finish up his bundle of shingles before he left for the night. He noticed that the curator of the museum had already left, and he was just nonchalantly banging the nails in, and he saw a small child go from one part of the house to the other. And he kind of did one of these and was looking in there, and then it kind of unnerved him because he knew what he had saw, and now he's tapping on the window trying to get whatever to come closer, and his first thought was one of the museum curator people that were work there left their baby there. A lot of the museums or, you know, the plantation, some of the ladies bring their children, you know, and work on the, at, at the buildings. So he figured that one of the, the ladies put the baby down for a nap, maybe left it, went home and forgot it. I mean, it happens. So he's tapping on the window. It, it, it nerved him so much that he ended up calling the police. The police come and they got the museum curator there. They open the house. Of course, he was not there. And, and the museum curator said that it was probably the fire, a small child that drowned in a bucket of water back in the 1700s. Wow. So, I mean, and to have, again, direct connections with history like that mm -hmm. is it's just, it, you, you can't beat it. I mean, you, nowhere else in the country can you match the history uh, of the ghosts that we have in this area. Uh, why don't we take a break? since we, we haven't taken a break uh, in a while. So let's take one. When we come back, we're going to talk about a few more locations uh, before we go. I don't know if we're going to get to actually play some of the evidence that Pilgrim Paranormal has, but it's on their website. If you go to pilgrimparanormal.com, you can check out EVPs. Yep. What are some of the locations that you have some evidence from on your site? Uh, we just recently, uh, a couple weeks ago, did the 1820 Courthouse. We have four other place, and that's uh, that's on the website. Um, there's quite a bit of audio clips. We actually have one really good picture from that, too. Um, If you need an investigative team, PilgrimParanormal.com, that's the way to go. Never charge for an investigation. Oh, of course, the good ones never do. Never. Except for the ones that say that they work for food, like Spooky <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll take a break, and uh, when we come back, we'll talk about some more locations. Uh, and if you want to call in with any questions real quickly before the end of the show, you can call in at 1-877-996-1420, 508-996-0500. Uh, for local calls. Uh, of course, Craig won't be able to hear you because we've got him on Skype, but we are broadcasting on our historyproject.com as well. So stay tuned. We'll be back with more here on Spooky South Coast. Mm -hmm.
for it. Uh, we'll just take a couple of minutes. If you, need, you need a few more than that, we can take a longer break. Alright, what do I have left here? I want to talk about Gordon's Park just because I used to hang out there a lot when I was younger. And I'm actually, I'm not proud of this, but I'm actually an Algonquin Park Heights kid. I lived there when I was, uh, I got out before things, well, no, things were bad, but I got out before I realized things were bad. I lived there from like, with first grade to the fifth grade. So it's all relative. It's bad for plumbing. It's not bad for plumbing. I don't know. I don't know. That's true. You're in and out of there. There are a lot more houses than I have. This was a little while ago. Yeah. What year was that? I would say 85 to 89. With AM so, you know, we had the stories about all the people getting murdered out in the pond and back and all that kind of stuff. So, yeah, yeah, I went to, I went, I started off at West for till fourth grade, and then for fifth grade I went over to Nathaniel Morton, which is still the coolest school I ever went to. <laughs> Did you have my mom at West School? I don't think so, no. For fourth grade, I had uh, Mrs. Sullivan. Patricia <coughs> Sullivan, was it? Yeah. It's amazing how you can, you don't remember this stuff yeah, until somebody asks. I think I can remember your fourth grade. Well, let me think. So let me think. I had Mrs. LaCalva in first grade. That's funny. I had Mrs. King in second grade, but she was gone for almost a whole year. Uh, Mrs. Chaskis in third grade. Mrs. Sullivan, and I had Mrs. Hoy in fifth grade. And then I moved to Sandwich after that. <laughs> Did you? I'll have to come out and join you. Yeah. 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 All your teachers? I'll tell you what's funny though, is being working on Comcast, you get, you always get the house when you walk in, and, and it's always downtown Plymouth. I can't tell you how many times this has happened. Right in this area we're talking about. You walk into a house, and you say, all right, what, what's the problem? Oh, it's a TV that's on the fritz or whatever. Yeah. I'm like, all right, where's the split? It's like in the basement. So they walk up, they walk up to the door, and they do one of these. Yeah, go ahead. Down there. And it's one of those where you walk to the door, and I'm like, ooh, I'm not going down there. They're like, yeah, we don't go down there either. I'm like, oh, so you're going to send me down there to feed me to the wolves, right? We're going to have to uh, we're gonna have to change where you have your sport. Yeah, basically. We just get people that don't. I'll send a new guy out there that doesn't know anything. What are we got, about 14 minutes left? Yep. That's a story I heard about Port of Spock. Bob left to confirm it, but they used to not tell the new guys about the ghosts. Yeah. <laughs> and they said about that before. Funny. Wait, do you, you don't mind jumping behind the microphone, do you? No, okay. Join us and send your message of support. And it's Bob, I'm sorry, Bob. Bob, yeah. Mm -hmm. Welcome back to Spooky South Coast and also to our history project, Tim Weisberg, along with the silent assassin, Matt Costa, science advisor, Matt Moniz, and of course, Craig Anderson from our history project is on the line as well. And don't be shy, Craig. Just jump in whenever you have any questions or, or anything that you want to ask the guests. All right. And uh, we, one of the spots that I definitely want to make sure we talk about is Cordage Park, because not only is it a, a really cool historical spot that needs to have more attention thrown on it, I think. Um, I don't know what's going on with it now. I haven't been there since Walmart moved, but uh, it, it, it seems like it's something that was falling by the wayside for a while, and I know there were some plans to reinvigorate it. Um, but it was founded in 1824 uh, as the Plymouth Cordage Company, and basically they make rope. And uh, for a long time, it was the biggest producer of rope, I think, in the country, right? Mm -hmm. And it later in became... World, yeah. In the world? Yeah. And it later became, you know, in, in our time, uh, it closed down in the what the 19 
early 1900s. Yeah. Uh, went out of business in 1964, out of over 140 years of continuous operation, and, and you know in the 80s it kind of became more small shops. World, World, World War II put it out of business. Really? And uh, the Dupont's invention of nylon. Yeah, that would that would do it. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so uh, when I was there, it was you know like a bunch of little shops, and there was a flea market there, and uh, we had a table there when I was younger. And one of the jobs that I used to get to do was they used to let me go around and open all of the doors so that people could get into the main part where all the shops were. And that was one creepy place uh, <laughs> to, to be walking around alone in the dark. And, and Bob, you actually worked there? I worked there for about two weeks. <laughs> <laughs> was, it, uh, was it the ghost that got you? Is that? No, they, they made a law. We had to carry firearms at the time. And I wasn't old enough to carry a firearm. I was only 17 when I first started a job. But when the flea market was, was actually built in 17, and back in the 1700s, the legend was they had a ship come in that was off fighting off the, Re the British out in Plymouth Harbor. Three men, three of the men mutiny, and they actually pulled them into Plymouth Harbor. And they brought them up to Cordage Park, and they actually hung them from chains. And every once in a while, you'd be standing down there, and the elevator would go up and down by itself. Mm -hmm. And we'd have to walk down here to the building and clock in with our little keys. You could hear the men screaming. You could hear like chains mm. dragging across the floor. So uh, all these all these denials and reports of ghosts are <laughs> are just to keep people out of there, huh? No. <laughs> <laughs> well, basically, they don't want you to go down there because there are tunnels down there, and we found out during World War II they actually stored live ammunition down in the tunnels. And there used to be one tower down there off to the south of building 17. We used to take the young children and especially young boys they'd load them down the chimneys and scrub the inside of the chimney though to get the creosol and stuff that mm -hmm. go and start fire. There was actually a report that a little seven year old boy fell down into one of the chimneys. They couldn't get him out and they actually roasted him alive. Mm -hmm. And we'd go down there, we'd have to clock in one of our clock buildings down that way and we'd be staying there. We could hear the little boy screaming. You would actually have rocks thrown at you. Wow. That would kind of freak you out. <laughs> uh, so I guess I wasn't alone in feeling that when I was uh, walking around that place. A very spooky place. And, uh, <coughs> yes, sorry, Greg. There's no secret passages that I know that are open to the public in Plymouth, but I know that many of the buildings in the downtown are connected by secret tunnels back from the Prohibition time. There was um, a secret hotel in one of the buildings and different things like that, but nobody likes to talk about it. Yeah. <laughs> but they're, they're still there, they're just not accessible? They're not accessible, but yeah, still there. Even in the, um, for instance, in the underneath of, uh, it used to be m and Sporting Goods, I think now it's an empty space, but it's the, it used to be William Bradford's home on the corner of uh, Main Street and Market. Uh, right that downstairs there, they have a bowling alley. Still fully intact in the basement. No wow. pin setters, but there's all kinds of different things down there that you wouldn't expect the bowling alley to be under one of the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that sounds really cool. And, it, you know, there's, if there's one thing we like to try to get into, it's tunnels. And uh, our friends at uh, Dartmouth Anomalies Research Team actually have a tank with a camera mounted on it, a remote control tank that they send into these things. It's, it's pretty funny. So uh, who knows, maybe someday, Craig, when you come up here, since you'll be making the trip all the way from Georgia, somebody will let you into a tunnel. Well, why don't everybody give your contact information for the tours? Oh, sure. For, for Colonial Inn Tours, if you don't mind, the first, the, uh, we have our, our website. It's the best way to get in touch with us. Oh, and it's www.lanterntours.com. And you can go on there and make uh, reservations for any date that you want to come. If you have a special request, like you're really interested in the tunnels, we could try to find some for your group or find out what information is available. 
So you can make a special request of us. Um, you can just send a, an email to info, I-N-F-O, at lanterntours.com, and we'll be able to respond to your special request. But, and especially if anyone who has been on the tour before, if you have any pictures um, that you think are questionable. I got one yesterday, and it, the guy was really interested in the ghost that was on the tour guide's back, but it was actually the reflective tape on her jacket you know, from the flashes. Going on, so I had to get back to him and let him know that it was it showed him a picture of another jacket just like it. But um, any pictures, you know, we do appreciate people sending in the pictures. And when do you hear about a ghost tour actually debunking some of the evidence that's caught on the tour, you know? <laughs> and uh, and Janice, what about Dead of Night Tours? Uh, Dead of Night Ghost, ghost, ghost Tours, our website is www.deadofnightghosttours.com. And we are open all year round. We just don't do tours when there's snow. And um, we will go out with EMF meters and take you to the most haunted places in Florida. All right. Sounds good. And uh, one place that I do want to talk about, which hopefully nobody's leaving tours out into at night, uh, is the Miles Sanders State Forest. Because we talk a lot about the Free Freetown State Forest uh, here on Spooky South Coast and a lot of the, the negative stuff that goes on out there. Miles Sanders doesn't have the, the cult activity at the level of Freetown State Forest. Thank God for that. Uh, but there are some pretty uh, paranormal stories coming out of there, including a, a, an old uh, asylum or an old some sort of uh, penal facility that is supposedly had its its share of paranormal activity. Um, I can't say anything. I I haven't researched it or, or done any you know work out there, so I can't say firsthand. I spent tons of time in Miles Sanders State Forest, and I know they do have the old um, facility there. I'm not sure exactly what the use was. I know at one time they had the, um, the men working during the Depression, and so the buildings that, that they used for, I believe it was rehabilitated mental patients, if that's the proper <laughs> word, can you say that? I don't know. Yeah, really, really <laughs> <laughs> but there were re people who were rehabilitated from some kind of state care, and they, they um, lived in this place out in the woods and did different forestry work. And then um, there was one instance of a uh, very horrible murder out there, one of the axe murder, while she was um, riding in the forest with her husband and her child, and they were separated um, doing their exercise part of their rides, and while the, the couple was separated, the woman was uh, murdered, and for a long time the husband was the suspect, and it was a, a pretty lengthy um, time period went by before, I think there was finally someone who got um, you know, convicted of the crime, but it took, I think, about 20 years. I think it was from 1977 to 2003. And Freetown Forest has a similar case where the, the man was just incarcerated last year from something that was 20 some odd years old with a 15 year old cheerleader. And even now he's still fighting it, so. Yeah, so it's a lot of history, of, and a lot of that does have to do with that kind of activity. Um, why those cases took so long, like in the Freetown case, a lot of that um, unusual activity was part of the, the defense. And I can tell you, though, that the the Miles Sanders State Forest is heavily patrolled. And when you go on these different ghost websites that tell you all these different haunted places, a lot of them will say, you know, warning, heavily patrolled. They're not kidding when they say it about uh, Miles Sanders because they've helped me out many times when I've been lost trying to cut through there to get from Plymouth home because I actually live, where I live in Wareham actually abuts right on Plymouth and there's some secret passageway back roads that we like to use to get in and out. And uh, Sometimes I don't always make it the right way in the dark. So. <laughs> Thank God for all the old drugs. I think last year they added two full-time state troopers, <laughs> which they didn't have before. Just, just to patrol the forest? Yeah. So. And, uh, you know, for, for such a cool place, I don't really hear a lot of reports of people uh, encountering spirits out there, so I think they're just maybe not paying attention to that. I can tell you, as a hunter, I'm in Freetown and Miles Standish. You know, not Miles Standish anymore, but, you know, I've been before the sun comes up and usually out before after the sun goes down. and. I've yet to have an experience in either of them, you know, and mm -hmm. I'm always looking. I'm <laughs> always looking. I can't imagine that in Freetown it, it hasn't happened yet from everything that goes on up there. Yeah, so that's it'll happen. I'm always looking. It'll happen. <laughs> well, uh, Craig, we're just about out of time here on the show, uh, and, and it was really cool to be able to simulcast this with you. I mean, we had such a busy show, we didn't really get to have a lot of back and forth, but uh, do you have any other final questions that you want to ask the panel? I'm not actually sure well, when they when they set it all aside as uh, forest land. I mean, I know 
As long as I've been alive, it has been. So that's only like 32 years, though. So drop in the bucket. But uh, no, I'll find out for you, Craig, for sure. Thank you for joining us, and let's do this again sometime. All right, that is Craig Anderson. And definitely check out our historyproject.com. And, and, you know, we're all about history here at Spooky South Coast, and we, we have a saying we say, come for the ghost, stay for the history. <laughs> you know, it's kind of, and I'm sure you guys see that nowadays with the tours. You know, you can't get kids to pay attention to the stuff, but if you can, I mean, I know when I would, I went to school at Nathaniel Morton right downtown in Plymouth, and they used to drag us to all these sites. And if they had just talked about ghosts, they would have held our interest a lot better. <laughs> Uh, so there, there you have it, teachers. Use the ghosts. All right, we'll be back next week with our big Rock for Christmas show. Uh, we're going to preview the upcoming Rock for Christmas show December 10th in Fall River with Wayne Morrison, the founder of Rock for Christmas. And we'll talk to some of the rock stars that he has this year. Uh, I'm hoping that Corey Glover from Living Color can join us because I really want to talk to him. He's just a big Living Color fan. And uh, he's also going to have Pat Travers there and Terry Luce of XYZ and a whole bunch more. So that will be our special episode next week. And then we'll get back into the paranormal after that with a whole bunch of stuff lined up. Uh, thanks to everybody for joining us. Again, deadofnightghosttours.com, lanterntours.com, pilgrimparanormal.com, southcoasttouringcomic.com, and uh, spookysouthcoast.com, of course. We're, we're now going to have the video every week on Spooky TV there, so pay attention. Uh, during the week, we'll have all the links changed, and you can change your bookmarks. And until next week, from Matt Costa, from Matt Moniz, from Chris Balzano, I'm Tim Weisberg, and we want you all to stay spooktacular. And in the future, we can definitely talk, you know, do like more one on one stuff. Uh, but I, I think we got a lot of information out there to be I'm sure there's a whole bunch of stuff we still have to talk about. You know, at least this way here, it gives people a taste. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. When you have three different, you know, perspectives. Well, that's the good thing, too, is because yeah. I was like, there's probably a lot of overlap for sites in your tour, and there's probably some different things, yeah. you know, that people don't. If they, you know, so we want to make sure they take both. Yeah. Is there uh, is there any spot that we didn't cover, though, that you felt that we really should have? Or? Just the only thing is on Lydon Street, you know, there's um, one place that I would like to talk about where the, uh, the murder took place. Um, I don't know how long the Freedom, Freedom of Information Act has before it kicks in, but there's 21 Lyman Street. First, with local news, and there's no This is WBSM New Bedford. Two recent deaths. AM 1420 WBSM. Like 10 or 11 years ago. And that was, um, the murderer's name was... Scientists reported seeing hundreds of centrifuges the, in North the, Korea the, this month, guys, according to the New York Times. The uranium enrichment program gives the country a second way to obtain materials. Is that where there's a lot of, uh, talk over to time, there's been a lot of bad things that have been happening, and then the China China next girl in there died in her sleep. President Obama is back in Washington after attending the two-day NATO summit in Portugal. President said he's confident.